on the next Roseanne Show, funny man Jamie Foxx. You like fat chicks, don't you? <laughs> Things get hot when Jamie serenades Roseanne. It's getting a little warm in here. I am. Are you single? No. <laughs> then, see if you can pass Roseanne's sex ed quiz. A male reaches his sexual peak at A16, B18, C when he gets to your house. <laughs> Pretty energized bunch, aren't you? Yeah. That's always nice. Coincidentally, we're doing a show, so we need you. Okay, you asked me questions, and so we pick some. I'm going to answer them. So when you know, you know to stand up when we say your name, right? So our first person is Claire Bray from Plymouth, England, all the way across the ocean. Hi. <laughs> From England. And here's your question, Claire. Are you just vacationing for a little while here? Um, we did. We worked in America for three months and we're traveling after. Wow, that's cool. Three months? Yep. Wow. Would you like to take us English folk out on the town? We would love to go. <laughs> I'd love to, but I'm busy. And next, Adam from Australia. Oh, wow. There are all kinds of... All sorts of people from around the globe. Australia. Are you on vacation here? Uh, working vacation. What so, does that mean? Uh, we're studying here. What are you studying? Acting, like everyone else. Oh, all right. <laughs> That's true. Your question. You want me to ask you a question. That's what it says. Ask me a question, please. Okay, would you like to take some English babes out tonight? <laughs> They're cute. And, and lastly, Angie Wade from Las Vegas. Oh, Angie. Angie wants to know... Where is the best place to make love? And I would have to say, in the kitchen so you're closer to the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> or in the fridge is the best, actually. We have a great show today. Jamie Foxx is here. <laughs> yeah, we love Jamie. And live via satellite from Missouri, a woman who does all sorts of amazing things with beads, Liza Lou. You guys will not believe what she's got. It's amazing. And the controversial former Surgeon General, Dr. Joycelyn Elders, is here. So stay tuned. is absolutely hilarious and he has a hit show on the WWB. Please welcome Jamie Foxx. Dizzy on there? Motion sickness. <laughs> Remind me of that cheap hotel. 
<laughs> you know those beds where they... You're breaking oh, oh, I'm it. I'm breaking up. I'm sorry, I didn't even break your stuff. I got money, though. I can pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, your suit is awesome. Thanks, thanks. You look you great. Look, so nice. look at the shoes. Yeah, the shoes. You look very <laughs> put together, very nice. Yeah, I got to take it all back, but it's time. <laughs> I got some big feet, huh? <laughs> well, you know what they say. Big feet? <laughs> big feet. <laughs> <laughs> I think they. <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. I think they say Big Feet WB, don't they? Yeah, Big Feet WB, right, right. <laughs> Got my rose colored glasses. Rose colored glasses. Mm -hmm. Oh, how nice See? of you. See? You look very nice. Thank you. You're very funny. Thank you. Congratulations on your show, too. Thank you. I mean, this is the first time I get a chance yours. to meet you. I never have met yeah, you. I, I felt, I isn't know, that weird? I, I dig your work. I know you did stand up and everything, which I'm a stand up and everything, yeah. so that's great. Tell us about uh, your early days since you had to change your name to get into oh, it. Oh, yeah, that's right, that's right. I was, I was Eric Bishop at first. That's your real name, Eric Bishop? Yeah, and I was running from the law. And, uh... <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I start... You know how it is. You start out as an amateur comedian. When you do the amateur night, you know, that's the, the name you write down. Mm -hmm. and Where'd you would, start out? I was, I was over at the comedy store, mm -hmm. like everybody right, else. Yeah. And then, like, you know, they picked Eric Bishop, and I went on and did pretty good. And then I didn't get called anymore because I think the, the other comedians were running the night. Right. So I went somewhere else and changed my name to Jamie Cash at first. It sounded too much like a country singer, so I changed that and uh, to like Jamie Foxx, and they didn't know who it was. Well, weren't you looking to get a name that sounded like a woman? Yeah, I was. I wanted a unisex name because, like, when when they were when they were picking people to go on stage, if if it was too many guys, you know, they just pick a girl just to break up the monotony. So I wrote down Stacy King and Tracy Brown, and, <laughs> and then wrote down Jamie Foxx. Is she here? And I was like, hey. And so I went up. <laughs> so I went up and uh and women, I don't know, women like to say Jamie. I don't know what it was. Like the ladies really caught on to it and I started a little mailing this, Jamie Foxx be a part of the Foxhole and all this other kind of stuff. And uh, this was before I was even doing any TV. I had my own little thing happening. You know? How how long ago was that? That was about eight, nine years ago. Wow. That was uh, I guess not well. Yeah, yeah, about eight, nine years. How ago. old are you? I'm thirty. Just turn young. You, you were really 30. young. Thirty, thirty, you know. So you were really young. Did you always want to be a comedian? I didn't even know I wanted to be a comedian. I, was, I went to the amateur <laughs> night and I was, we had a couple of drinks or whatever. And you and, just got and drunk and funny. it came over you? I went on stage as Bill, I went on stage as Cosby, like, you know, I'm drunk and I've been drinking and this, that, and the other. And, and people started laughing and stuff. And I was doing all the different impersonations that I knew. And uh, So you just had all this stuff in you your whole life and it just came out one night when you were drunk? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> well, you know, a lot of stuff comes out when you're drunk. <laughs> but uh, but I, I was trying to get into music. I was, I was trying to do everything, you know, to, to make it you're, happen. Because you're a classically yeah. trained pianist, aren't you're you? You're doing classical piano, and then the next thing you know, I'm telling jokes. I had to tell my grandmother that all the money you spent on college, I'm a comedian now. Did and she think like, that was pretty funny? Boy, have you lost your damn mind? <laughs> <laughs> and then I told her how much money you make, and she said, well, boy, I keep on joking. <laughs> so, uh... So, you know, it, it turned out it turned out real good. Now I can, you know, do anything I want to now. You know what? You got a really dysfunctional family. Yeah. Tell us about it, won't you? <laughs> well, I'm glad you guys think it's so funny. <laughs> no, I, actually, my, my mother was adopted by this lady. And then afterwards, when my mother had me, the lady adopted me also. So legally, my mother's my sister. So it's not a Southern thing. It's oh, just... that's great. You yeah. got to get better. That's great. Yeah. So legally, my mother's my sister. That's good. Uh, but I still, I still had a chance to, you know, to, uh, you know, I, I knew my mother, which is, which is cool. Not well, a lot of adopted kids. Young, yeah, right? she's very young. Not a lot of adopted kids get a chance to know who their biological parents are. But the lady that adopted me, Estelle Talley and Mark Talley, really gave me a chance to grow up like in the country and, wow. and, and out of the fast pace and really raised me right. So where when was I this got at this that you grew up? in Terrell, Texas, big town. You know, and y'all ain't from Terrell. They, no they might be too. from Texas. Might be from Texas. Well, right? you know, I have a daughter yeah. that I gave up for adoption right. when That's she was right. born. She's back now. Guys, Been back, back about again. 10 years. That must be unbelievable. But she grew up in Texas also. Oh, is that so, right? Yeah. Well, do I know her? Where's she? Well, you'll meet her after. Okay, great. I think you talked to her. Is a little that right? Bit. Right. So right, right, I right. think adoption's a great thing, it's too. A, it's a cool thing. And so, you know, and, that, and that's a little bit of, of our message that we're trying to get out there, too, because, like, without having somebody there to kind of like lead you in a certain direction. It wasn't like, you know, she was just, uh, 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 you know, the iron fist, but she gave me some, right. some decent values, some decent morals. So when I got to this town, I wouldn't unravel too much. And you didn't, did you? Uh, uh, yeah, no.
No. I'm pretty cool. No, you took good care of yourself. Yeah. Now you got your own show. Yeah. You yeah. are so funny. Happy, happy doing our own show on the. On I the like WB. that ugly lady you do. Oh, uh, the, uh, the oh, you uh, which one was that? The, the real Wanda ugly lady. Oh, the Wanda character. Yeah. Uh, uh huh. That was a trip because like uh, when I got on Living Color, I wouldn't. I wasn't considered like, you know, the in crowd or whatever. So that one character was the one character that that launched everything and and I didn't know if people really even knew it was me. I would go to uh, to 7-Eleven and just stand and try to see if people noticed me. <laughs> and, and, and uh -huh. stuff like that. And did they? Yeah, they noticed it, but this one girl, I, it tripped me out. This one girl says, I know you. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you sell records and tapes on Wilshire and La Cienega. <laughs> And, but, you know, eventually it caught on and everything like that, and uh, I just went on from there, you know? That ugly lady is so yeah, funny. Yeah, it was crazy, because a lot of, it was a lot of, and I got a lot of backlash from that, too. Ugly women running up on me and stuff. <laughs> you know you wrong for all that. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I wasn't necessarily talking about anybody ugly. It was just that attitude. You know how you her have some friends? Her attitude's awesome, yeah. Her yeah. attitude was awesome. And she then, thinks uh, she's the most beautiful woman yeah, on earth. Yeah, and she, she was never. She was never. <laughs> Yeah, she looks like you. That's what's wrong. She yeah. has a mustache and every other thing. Yeah, yeah. You so. like fat chicks, don't you? <laughs> Being from Texas, I like them a little healthy. That's I like good. them. I like them healthy. Look, she's like. She can't play. You gotta change. There's nothing wrong with it. I think sometimes they How go too cool far. How cool is that that a guy likes some yeah. a woman with meat on her with in this meat, town? You know what I'm saying? I'm saying I, I, I like that. You know, it's like when I when I like first got here. Like how big though? What's the ideal? I go chubby. 175, 180. As long as it's you know it's this proportion. You can't be built like you know, like Sinbad. I mean, <laughs> you no, know I mean because Sinbad has that. You know, how Sinbad has right. that where, where his back is. <laughs> I know him. He ain't tripping. He knows his... <laughs> Come on back. We're going to be here with Jamie Foxx. Yeah. I'll say that about you. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> please give it up for Mr. Jamie Foxx <laughs> on the piano and vocal. So this is where I kind of started out before I was doing the jokes and everything like that. And I would like, uh, I used to write tunes. When I was young, I'd write tunes that didn't rhyme and last about 30 minutes. <laughs> but <laughs> I, finally, I finally figured it out. And sometimes I would sit, um, like I went on a date with a girlfriend of mine and I would write like, you know, from different dates. Like we was watching this movie and we was like, the love scene in the movie was so sweet and nice and everything was just right. But you know, when you're making love, it's, you know, hold on, let me take this off, let me get this off. Okay, okay. Oh, oh, that hurts. No, 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 don't, no, no. So I was thinking now, what if you could make love like they make love in the movies? And I wrote this little song to it, and you know, I hope you dig it. So it's kind of like, let's make love like they make love in the movies, baby. Uh, baby, let's kiss like we just kissed for the very first time, my, my love. Let's make love like they make love In the heat of the moment, don't you want it? A girl, it's like a movie when we make love And in the verse it'd be like, it's the morning And I wake to see your face like an angel up the place a girl just hold me and then you'll understand I'll be your lead you'll be my leading lady and I'm your leading man and we'll make love like they make love in the moon Like we just kissed for the very first time. Uh, let's make love like they make love in the heat of the moment. Don't you want a uh, girl? It's like a movie.
You're so good. That's a great song. Thanks. That could be number one. I'm thinking I need to go ahead and press that up. I think you should. It's romantic and sweet. You've got a great voice. Thank you. I appreciate it. What else you got? Play something else. What, play something else? <laughs> Rose, can I be your man? I don't mind. I ain't a shit. We'll be right back. Say thank you to Mr. Jamie Foxx. No, you can't be my man. this awesome artist who celebrates domestic goddesses everywhere. Now, check out this beaded plunger that she made. I mean, the whole thing's totally beaded. This woman has lost her mind. <laughs> Please welcome, straight from the Kemper Museum in Kansas City, Missouri, Liza Liu. Hey! Hi, Liza. Hey, Roseanne, you domestic goddess, you. The how are You're such you? You're a babe. I'm just fine, thank you. How are you? Um, pretty good. This plunger is pretty awesome. You're sitting there in the middle of your exhibit where you've beaded an entire kitchen. I know. I kind of lost lost track of reality for about five years. So. Well, well, you've just lost your mind, haven't you, Eliza? <laughs> It's art, so let me give you a tour. Do you want to want me to just show you around? Well, my... first I want to I want you to answer this question: How you went from being a bad waitress to a bead <laughs> artist? Well, most people who are waitresses are actors, and I was an artist, and so I got fired because I, I wasn't good at serving. So I decided to really work on my art instead. So here I are, about almost ten years later. So it's a good thing. Now it says that you've got 40 million beads in this kitchen in this backyard exhibit of yours. I know, that's scary, huh? It took you 10 years. Yeah, well, this no, this piece only took five. So come on, I'm showing you okay, around show now. Us, yeah. Come on. Okay. All right, so the inside of the stove has beaded um, babes, sort of nude babes from the mud flaps that you see on trucks. I hate that. So I wanted to sort of put them in the kitchen. I'm celebrating women's work. And this piece is really about taking, I hate to clean. So this piece is about, if we have to clean, we should have a permanently perfect kitchen. So right. even the dust balls are perfect. Oh my god, you've got beaded dust balls in yes, the dust Yes, honey. <laughs> if you have a beaded plunger, there should definitely be beaded dust. Now wait so, a minute, okay. what was that tide bottle, that tide box? I know. Okay. Well, Here's the Tide Box, Roseanne. That is awesome. Yes. It's When's just last amazing. time you washed your own dishes? It's just amazing, Liza. Okay. What a Goodness. great job. Now let's see the frying pan. Look at the frying pan. So even the frying... This is all paper mache. Oh, my God. I signed God. my name. I kind of like that. An egg, a beaded egg. It's kind of... It's rock hard, though. It's so Can't, cool. I, I'm going to show you through. All right. When I was doing this piece, it took me five years. And when I was doing it, I thought, what do you look at when you look through the windows of the kitchen? Well, you see a beaded backyard. So oh. I spent the next two years oh my God. Um, beating an entire backyard. So I bet my backyard is a lot shinier than everybody else's. I guess I I'm kind of competitive. Too. Well, it's kind of like keeping up with the Joneses times 10 million or quadrillion, billion, illion. Wow. So, <laughs> There's like a quarter of a million blades of beaded grass here. Oh and you see flowers. God. And there's a tree. And so it's kind of a celebration of everyday life. Oh, it's just fantastic. Look at that barbecue all beaded. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Everybody kind of likes the barbecue. And everybody likes amazing? the big fat bug. So Let's check, check out, the, out the picnic, uh, the, the uh, you know, tablecloth there. I, I want to look at that. Isn't it good? Are you into the food? Check out the beer, Oh, yeah. Let's see woman. the food. Definitely. I, I want to see the food. Roseanne, it's so exciting because you're the ultimate domestic goddess. So Why, you thank completely... you, Liza. Well, you are. Hello. You're, you know, inspiration. So check it out. We have the beer, and it's Oh, my it's beaded. God. So my work is really about taking everyday life and enshrining it because it's a celebration, and the labor itself is a kind of prayer. So I know you think I'm crazy, but I swear to God I'm normal. Can you show and... us, show us that corn on the cob? Oh, check out the corn on the cob. I just well, cannot believe you. This was um, kind of fun because. Oh it's, my God! Isn't that? The pat of butter. Isn't that incredible? It was really it's fun. <laughs> it was really fun to, <laughs> to do. It's just. But what about 
What about that lawnmower back there? That's beaded. Check out the lawnmower. I gotta Hello, see that. The lawnmower. I know. Well, go go cruise over here. Look, oh my I'm God. Show you. Okay, I'm tiptoeing through the tulips. But Roseanne, you have to come to the museum. And oh, see I'd this. love to, Liza. Yeah. People come to art museums. Look at the lawn ornaments. Look at the pink flamingos. Oh, I love those. They're fabulous. Don't you kind of have to have those? Yeah, you know I have a whole yard full of pink flamingos. I know. They're not You're beaded. You're my woman. You're my gal. You're, you get this stuff. So look. Liza, is... tell me something, just seriously what? for a minute. Okay. What is this a metaphor for? Well, it's a celebration of everyday life, and this is this whole piece is about leisure and about the American dream. But the reality of doing it is this painstaking labor. So there's this kind right. of irony. And um, I like subverting this stuff, you know, sort of making everything really pretty when we know that real life never measures up. Real life sucks. So I try to make it look really, really good. So you even have stuff mission. hanging up there on the laundry clothesline. Yes, doll. But see, I Oh, my I know. God. It's, every, it's everywhere. It's out of control. And How my next awesome piece is, is that? Chapel. How awesome it must be to be somebody who invented something that nobody else has ever done. It's kind of cool. It's neat. You get a prize for originality in this world, which is kind of cool. And I think that's why the stuff's in art museums, because, um, you know, people want to look at things they've never seen before, and that's why they come out here. So it's been really great. Okay, thank you, Liza. Bye. Bye-bye. And up next, Dr. Jocelyn Elders. We're coming right back. teach a sex ed class today, but then I figured uh, teenagers think they already know everything about sex, so we're just going to have a test. Here we go. The fallopian tube is A, something boys don't have, B, a brass instrument, <laughs> C, something that goes inside a radial tire. Hey! You're a good, good group. <laughs> Number two, this is A, the last thing you see before you hear the word cough. <laughs> B, a brassiere for a cow. C, a condom for group sex. <laughs> see how smart you are? When a girl says no, she really means A, no, B, no, C, no, or D, all of the above? Oh. That's right. A male reaches his sexual peak at A, 16, B, 18, C, when he gets to your house. <laughs> A female reaches her sexual peak, A, the day after the male's peak ends. <laughs> B, if you got the money. <laughs> or C, when she feels like it. <laughs> a classic sign of pregnancy is A, morning sickness. B, your boyfriend's phone is disconnected. <laughs> or C, you're dizzy at the prom. I think you were very well educated, a group of people. And up next, Dr. Joycelyn Elders will clear this all up for all of us. So stay tuned. On the next Roseanne Show, rock and roll diva Grace Slick. You got it on with Jim Morrison. been criticized over the years for her controversial views and her liberal attitudes. Let's take a look. In regard to masturbation, I think that that is something that uh, it, it's a part of human sexuality and it is a part of something that perhaps should be taught. I do feel that we would markedly reduce our crime rate if drugs were legalized. If reproductive choice is to be a reality, in our country, reproductive choice must include access to the latest, most effective 
means of contraception. She's with us today to talk about how parents are the ones that need to be educated the most. Please welcome former U.S. Surgeon General Dr. Joycelyn Elders. <laughs> You are just really awesome. Thanks. Um, that speech was awesome, and it just was maybe like a case of the right thing to say at the wrong time. Do you think that's what <laughs> happened? Well, I'm not sure it wasn't the right thing to say even at the right time. Uh, you know, the fact that I'm not still the Surgeon General and the fact that I was fired about it m might not, you know, I, I may have done something good for the country. Yeah because it made us all talk about it. I bet more people talked about masturbation in December of 1994 <laughs> than we've ever talked about it in the history of our country. I bet that's right. Well, how did it feel, though, to get that phone call asking for your resignation? Well, you know, to not say I that mean, I... I mean, were you just shocked? Yes. You know, to yes. not say that I was shocked and sad, I didn't know how to react because I had no idea it was coming. Mm -hmm. You know, it isn't like I was thinking, well, any day it might happen. Right. I wasn't. And so when I was first called in by the secretary and then Mr. Panetta called and I'm wanting my resignation on his desk by 2.30, I was absolutely shocked. And I told him I wasn't going to resign un unless the president himself asked me. He asked me to come to Washington and he asked my husband to retire and leave his job. So he was going to have to ask me to leave. Well, and he obviously chose you because he had total confidence in you. I think so. And then... Um, well, how did it make you feel that he just, like, totally did a turnaround? Oh, well, you know, I really think that so many things was going on with the president and with our country in November of 1994, and he didn't know quite how to handle that, and I think he had to listen to his advisors. What was going on in 1994? I don't remember nothing going well, on. Well, the, uh, the Repu Republicans had just taken over the Congress, oh. and so, you know, as a politician, you know, that was probably a very so bad we, thing well, as far what as he was, was the concerned. Deal? Like he was, he felt he, that, did he feel embarrassed or? Well, I think he felt that the country felt that we was moving too far to the, quote, left or more, mm -hmm. too liberal, and they wanted to be more toward the center. Well, I was an easy target. Yeah, you were. The, I was always were just, out there you talking. You were just too real, I think. Too real, too truthful. Let's do talk about the kind of things you think we should teach in school about sex? Well, but you know, first of all, I think that uh, we, we need to start early. We are doing too little too late. Right. And our parents need to be involved in helping to teach the children. The reason our parents don't do a better job, nobody taught the parents. I think that's so right. they don't know what to do. And you know, we as parents don't ever want to do anything wrong. I think yeah. the recent time poll showed that only 7% of children got their sexuality education from their parents. Well, that's just horrible. It is. And all these parents are going around saying, hey, we want to teach it ourselves, but then they don't. But that's right. And I think they don't because they don't know how. They want to. Oh, I think they're embar it's embarrassing. I mean, I, sure. have, I have five kids. And I just tried to, um, it, you know, it's, it is hard to tell your kid. It is. It is. It's embarrassing. You don't want your kids thinking you do stuff like that. Well, well, well of course not. But, you know, I think that we as parents have got to learn, first of all, we've got to equip ourselves with the knowledge right. so we can teach our children. And there's a lot of knowledge. I know one thing I did was I gave my kids books when it was too embarrassing. Right. And I think we can, you know, there are many books out there. And then I think the other thing is we have to make it age appropriate. Age appropriate, right. And it, and it has, we have to be truthful about it. Right. And we can't embarrass our children or we can't make them feel ashamed about certain things. Right. You know, about touching themselves or things of, of that sort. And you know, Why we, do we do that, though? Well, I think that it's because we think that it's that that's the right thing to do. But we know it isn't because we wouldn't listen to that and we know we didn't listen when they told us that, so why are we passing on the same old stuff that used to make us mad and we never believed in in the first place? Well, you know, we, we just keep hanging on <laughs> and we keep pretending, you know, we always talk about back in the good old days. Well, first of all, the good old days were never as great no. as we are out there pretending they were. Right. And many, we know that, one of the other things is that children are going into puberty earlier. 
and they're exposed to more on TV and right. other things. And then the other thing, many of them have vehicles. Right. And they can get across That's town. That's what I was saying to that girl. <laughs> you know, that's right. They can get across town. And the most of our teenage pregnancies occur between 3 o'clock in the afternoon and 6 o'clock. Wow. That, well, that's when they're out of school and the parents are at work. Oh, that's exactly it, isn't it? Yes. But we don't, we don't give them uh, the right kind of information to protect themselves either. No. And we, we, don't, we don't give them the information. We don't want the school to give them well, the We don't want anybody to tell our kids. That's right. How to keep themselves responsible and to keep themselves safe. That's right. We're, we're crazy. Anyway, we're going to go to a commercial, then we're going to be back with more with Dr. Joycelyn Elders after that. We're all nuts. We've got nuts. Take. shocking to me that 56 percent of uh, sexually active high school kids only 56 percent use a condom yes I mean what are they thinking they, I mean obviously when you're that age you think you're invincible but my god well you know first of all Roseanne they we are convincing them to, all they need to do is just say no and you know and we're teaching them to be abstinent well you know every mother we know every teacher we know every preacher we know we've been teaching that for a thousand years right. but we all know that the vows of abstinence break far more easily than does latex condoms. And so we've not educated our children, to, um, we've not empowered them. No, absolutely to, not. Uh, all I these... wonder if these people who are telling us all this stuff, I don't think they have kids. Because you but, have to worry about your kid going out there in the world and you have to equip them to survive there. So what are they thinking? They've forgotten. Yeah. They've forgotten what they did. Well, isn't it some kind of the most incredible, irresponsible parenting to not do that for your child? I really consider it child abuse. I do, too. I know. When you consider, in our country each year, mo more than a million teenage girls become pregnant. Right. We have more than 500,000 births. And three million, three million teenagers have a sexually transmitted disease every yeah. year. And AIDS is rising most group. rapidly in, in our group. adolescents. So obviously the just say no thing is not working. Well, I think we, you know, we have to have the just say no, we have to have the condoms, we have to have everything else. What else can we have, Dr. Oh, Elders? Well, I think we need to start out, first of all, if we educate our parents, we need to have comprehensive health education or sexuality education in our schools. That's the only way all the children are going to get it. We don't depend on the parents to teach physics. Right. We make sure that they have health education at school. And then we have to make contraceptives available to our young people. Yeah, and unless we really don't care and want them all to die. I'm going to go out and get questions from young people. Look, okay. how, look, we got a lot of nice young people out here. So who's got one? Oh, look at oh, this. They all want to know about sex. You're first, because I'm landing here. What's well, your name? Sarah. Sarah. How old? 17. What's the best way to stand up to peer pressure? Well, I think the best way to stand up to peer pressure is obviously make empower yourself with knowledge. If you know that, you know, that if, when they're pressuring you, if they say, well, everybody's, have, everybody's doing it, but just, well, just because everybody's doing it doesn't mean that I have to do it. If you feel good about yourself, good about who you are, you don't have to worry about what your peers think. Yeah. You know, there's always tomorrow, too. And you don't want to feel bad tomorrow, right? Right. So we'll think about the next day. You had one. Yes. What's your name first? Danny. How old? I'm 14. Whoa. <laughs> what would you say is the biggest problem American teens are having today? I think the greatest problem the teens are having today is really related to education. You know, I think that our teens need to make sure that they, you know, really go to stay in school and feel good about themselves and get a good education. And, you know, and I'm, I think sometimes they don't think that that's critical. Also, I think uh, the, that another problem they're having is, is uh, consequences. Understanding 
and foreseeing consequences. So we're not teaching them that either. Oh, absolutely not. And nothing that they do, you know, they see everything on TV and there's never a consequence. There's never a price to pay for any of it. Okay, I'm going over here. Stand up. What's your name? In here, in here. Hi, my name is Siobhan. Um, and you're how old? I'm 19, and I have a kid myself. I was wondering, I have a little girl, what is the appropriate age to discuss sexual education with her? And how would I go about discussing it to her, you know, to right. inform her? Because I wish that I could go back, you know, but I can't. But I want to make sure that she don't make the same mistake as me. So well, do you think that it's because you didn't have information that you got pregnant? No, I don't think that, but... I wanna, I wasn't informed on all of the information that's out there, you know. At least she can have that knowledge and make the decision by me not knowing I took the steps that I took, you know. Well, I think the most important thing that you can do, of course, is first of all, go out and inform yourself. You know, get, go to the library, get books, or read books, and then use that information to give age-appropriate sexuality information to your child that is honest so that you can prevent them, first of all, from being abused. You know, many girls who become pregnant have been abused at some point during their life. And we need to protect our children from abuse. And right. we need to help them develop their own self-esteem. And it has to be age appropriate. You know, you can't be talking, and you've got to do it over and over again. You can't talk to her once and feel that you've right. done your job. I you think it's the first time they ask a question. That's, that's when it's age appropriate to answer it. Yes. Oh, I think part of that's true, but you know, we can't always wait until our children come and ask the question. But then you know what? They ask them so early, <laughs> Dr. Ellis. They ask you stuff at one and two, and if you don't answer it then, then they, they wait a real long oh, time to ask you again. Oh, Any time they ask, you've got to answer the question. And that's why I say you have to start very early to preparing yourself to be knowledgeable, but always, always be an approachable parent. So they will always come to you rather than That's going good. to somebody else. Thank you. How old are you? 17. And what's your name? Benny. What do you want to ask? Um, I wanted to know, um, what do you think um, America's teachers should teach teenagers? Should they say, oh, well, should, you go, should they go on full force and say, you know, use condoms, this, you know, contra contraceptives, everything like that? Or should they say, you know, don't do it, you're too young? Yeah. Because saying both is kind of like contradicting yourself. And to America's teenagers, I don't think that's, yeah, a good way to approach people like that. First of all, if we wait until you get to be 17, that's too little too late. We need to start early and we need to build on it and you know and gradually get to where we are and again all parents are always teaching you to not have sex early because of the consequences but if you choose to be sexually active i think they always also want you to use a latex condom they don't want you to get aids they don't want you to have an std and they don't want you to get a girl pregnant that you did when you weren't ready to be a father that's right thank you Okay, I, I think I'll take just a couple more. A couple more. You're too old, honey. <laughs> Stand up. What's your name? Michael. And how old are you, Michael? 16. And your question is? Do you think that all the uh, hype that the media is giving to uh, new, ta new AIDS technologies is causing uh, teens to become careless and not use condoms because they have a false sense of security about yeah, you know, Michael, that's an excellent question. An excellent. And, but, you know, we do not have a vaccine for AIDS yet. We do not have a cure. We've improved our medication. We do not know how long it will work. I think we still have to make sure that we protect ourselves always from any, getting any type of disease. If you get one uh, sexually transmitted disease, you increase your risk of AIDS 25%. Wow, I didn't know that. It's pretty amazing. All right, I'll take one more over here. Excuse me, <coughs> I'm going to step right on you. Yeah. Name and age first. Anna, and I'm 17. Um, would you be comfortable if your son or daughter had sex at an early age? You know, I would love for my son or daughter to not have had sex at an early age, but if they choose to be sexually active, I certainly want them to be, you know, to be safe. 
I feel that we need to empower our children <laughs> to be honest with each other. You know, many boys lie to girls. So we need, they need to have honesty. I always talk about the her concept. To be honest, empowered with knowledge, and responsible. And you know what else, Dr. Elders, I think? Here's my two cents. You also have to be conscious of what the sex act is about. It's not shaking hands. <laughs> That's it's not about shaking hands. It's not something that doesn't have to do with the most intimate thing that we right. do as human beings. And how it's been so devalued that, you know, I really do think a lot of people treat it like, you know, a party favor. Well, you know, I think that that's true. And, you know, and, and we need to teach our children to respect their body parts. Right. And we also need to teach our children uh, not only about respecting their our different body parts, but we have to teach them about privacy. Absolutely. Uh, you know, and you know, there are certain parts of their body is just very private. And we teach young children there are certain places on your body nobody should touch. If you do, you need to tell somebody. And so I think that our, if, you know, if children are touching themselves, well, we don't need to push their hands away. What we need to tell them, you know, if they choose to do that, they need to do it in the privacy of their right. own rooms. There right. are certain things that we just don't do in public. That's right. I really don't think that there's ever anything uh, as too much information. And I thank you very much, Dr. Elder for being here with us oh, today. Oh, it was a real pleasure. Thank you. Pleasure for me, for all of our kids. I would like to thank all of my guests today. I hope we all learned a little something about sex. You're never too old to learn. Okay, that's it. I'm done. Let's all go home. Thank you for watching. Okay. Now, Liza, take us out to the backyard. Show us your backyard. Ready, set, Liza, show us that tide box.